Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Bulat Bash. I am an assistant professor in the EC department, and uh, I have an appointment here at the Obstacle Sciences College as well. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's colloquial speaker, Matthew Block. Matthew Block comes to us from Georgia Tech, where he is a professor, and uh, he has uh, is one of the very few people who started out in quantum and then went to classical. And now he's back in quantum and he will tell us uh, about the uh, covert and uh, secure quantum networks. Um, Matthew has received his PhD degrees from uh, two institutions, Georgia Tech and uh, Supelec, Gilles uh, Silhouette in France. Um, he has co-authored many papers and been very active in IT society, in IEEE. He has, uh, he has received a number of awards from IEEE and uh, was an associate editor for the transactions on information theory. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Matthew and uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you all for attending. Well, thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, I have to say I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. It's my first business trip in what seems like forever. I had kept my last uh, airplane ticket, and when I checked when I left home, I think it was dated back to February 2020. And I'm very excited to be here. I had been meaning to visit, actually, uh, University of Arizona, because I've been interacting with Sekat and Bulat for a long time. I know Jeshen Zhang. Where are you, Jeshen? There you, sorry, here you are, for a long time. And um, actually, Jeshen was my first PhD committee at Georgia Tech. So I take credit for his success because I graduated him. Um, um, and you know, I, I like to bring a little bit of humor as possible in my talks. And as, as Bulat said, I, I started in the quantum optics lab and actually went to information theory. Um, and you know, judging by how big quantum is today, you can tell a lot about my ability to predict the future and have a lot of foresight about research. But uh, all that said, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm going to talk today about something that actually was triggered by discussions and presentation I had seen from uh, several of your colleagues here, specifically uh, Bulat Bash and Sekat Guha. And so it's kind of nice to come full circle and finally uh, come here to, to discuss. So um, I've tried to keep my talk not to quantum information theoretic, because I think uh, the audience is a bit broader here. So there's minimal math here. And uh, my objectives are really to convince you that coding is something that matters. Uh, I come you know, from the classical world of information theory and coding. And, and coding is the ability to control how you introduce redundancy in sequences, if you wish. And I'll make a case for why it matters, specifically here in the context of covert and secret quantum networks. To position you know, what I'm going to talk about in the grand scheme of things, quantum communication is big. I mean, it's come back in the news big times over the last five years. Um, people are reporting amazing engineering feats you know, where you have a satellite being able to distribute entangled photons you know, across thousands of kilometers. People are definitely recognizing that quantum communications have leaped out of the lab, meaning they're not just you know, on a tabletop experiment. You have a quantum hub here on campus, which I was forbidden to turn off by Jeshen when we visited the lab. Um, you know, there are amazing satellite-relayed international quantum networks being reported. People are talking now about the quantum internet, and you know, very specific to the University of Arizona, you now have uh, an amazing uh, quantum center here. Uh, that was uh, supported by NSF. So quantum is becoming big. But if you look you know, really at you know, what has really leaped out of the lab in terms of quantum communication, there's really a one archetypal example of something that people have really deployed at scale. And that's uh, a very specific type of quantum communication called quantum key distribution. Um, and the idea behind quantum key distribution is that somehow you want to exploit the laws of quantum mechanics to create systems that are unconditionally secure in the sense that you're making no other assumption besides that quantum mechanics and its laws hold true. Um, and for instance, what you're not making as an assumption is that you have a protocol that is hard to break because it's very complex. Okay? You're assuming that you're acting against adversaries that might have all the quantum computers in the world, all the quantum memories in the world. And what's really happening, why that is actually even possible, I'll try to highlight that in a second, is that because of 
the very peculiar nature of, of, of quantum, and especially quantum optics, it's possible for legitimate parties to infer what an adversary is doing just by making measurement at legitimate terminals. And ironically, this idea is almost four decades old. The first paper that proved that it was indeed possible is a very seminal and foundational paper by uh, Charles Bennett uh, and, and Gilles Brassard in 1984. Um, and that was a little bit of an obscure paper, but experiments followed suit quite quickly. And the first paper demonstrating experimental quantum cryptography is from 1992. So uh, that was a demonstration over a link that was 12 centimeter. And arguably, it was only secure against quantum adversaries. Uh, if you were standing there, you could probably decrypt everything. And in a nutshell, the, the idea why that works is because in, in a quantum setting, if Alice is trying to send a quantum state to a quantum uh, receiver Bob, if there's somebody in between that starts intercepting, they're going to do some manipulation. But imagine you have a photon. The photon hint can be measured, but it cannot be split into two halves. And so as a result, uh, whatever your adversary does will have an impact on what your receiver will detect. And quantum cryptography is essentially the ability to put that uh, into, into play operationally. And so intuitively what you want to imagine is that if Alice sends a sequence of bits over a quantum channel, if you have an adversary that tampers with it too much, then you'll start seeing errors in your sequence. And these errors here are purely classical, and if Alice and Bob talk to each other, maybe they can figure out what happened. So we could spend you know, a month talking about quantum key distribution. The next thing I want to do is make sure I introduce the concepts that are relevant to understanding the basic operation of quantum key distribution. And so I have one slide where we'll go through the prototypic, prototypical protocol that people deploy to perform quantum key distribution, and then we'll build upon that. So the way a quantum key distribution protocol operates is as follows. There is always a first phase during which Alice and Bob will exchange quantum states. Actually, they will exchange uh, classical bits of information encoded on quantum states. And an adversary will be there, might not be there, but then they will try to infer the presence of the adversary. And the idea is that, as I illustrated in the previous slide, there is a public communication that goes on that discloses some of the measurements that Bob made and the results to Alice, and they try to estimate the information leaked to the eavesdropper. To simplify a little bit more and try to avoid being too quantum here, what you want to imagine is that there's a joint distribution between what Alice sends, what Bob receives, which I call Y, and what Eve intercepts, that's called Z. And somehow, through the magic of quantum mechanics, Alice, Bob, and Eve are able to infer what is that joint distribution of their measurements. So in, you know, in pictures, Alice has a sequence of bits that she's encoding onto quantum states, transmit to Bob, and Bob will effectively measure another sequence, which in general will have some errors in it. And these errors are going to be partly due to the fact that he has an imperfect system and measurement errors, but also will be influenced by whatever the eavesdropper is doing during the transmission. And at the end of this first phase, what happens is that Alice and, and, and Bob can somehow, by comparing their measurements, and effectively it boils down to measuring error rates. Okay, and you need a lot of quantum mechanics to prove that but they can somewhat infer how much information he has obtained about what they were transmitting. And then they have two options. If they feel that Eve has too much information, like she has effectively intercepted everything and tried to replicate what she received, then they can abort. Or if they estimate that Eve has some information, but not too much, which I represent here pictorially by showing that Eve has potentially more errors in red than, than Bob, then they can decide to proceed and try to do something with uh, that situation. Okay, so phase one, it's essentially a transmission of quantum states and what is effectively a quantum tomography phase to infer what is the joint state between all the three parties here. But the key part here is that at no point does that involve the eavesdropper disclosing anything. The eavesdropper stays silent, but through joint measurements at Alice and Bob, you can infer what uh, Eve is doing, and that's purely based on quantum mechanics. It takes uh, quite a bit of effort to prove that formally. But once you've done that, you can actually run very classical protocols to effectively extract a secret key from that. And that typically operates in two steps. A first step is called information reconciliation. The idea is effectively that Alice and Bob know that Bob has some errors, so Alice has to correct these errors. And that's done by sending a little bit of extra information. So we already see 
here coding uh, coming into the picture, what Alice will do is she will create a function of her sequence. I'm going to call that W. She's going to send it to Bob through a public channel. So potentially Eve gets to see that. But that information is tailored to allow Bob to form an estimate of what Alice has transmitted. And so suddenly the red errors have turned into green. We've corrected them. That's effectively a fancy error correcting code. Now, of course, because everything is public here, what's happening is that Eve gets to benefit from that extra information, right? Remember, Eve has potentially some information. Now you give even more because you're sending additional information through a public channel. And so presumably Eve is able to correct a few more errors. But remember, from the beginning, Alice and Bob have decided that Eve doesn't have too much information, so they're essentially allowing themselves to proceed forward because they know that even after error correction, there are still some lingering errors potentially in what Eve can estimate. Is that W also a quantum state that is transmitted? Excellent question. Everything is classical at that stage. W is really, you know, if I want to be fancy, it's a syndrome of an error correction code. Now, all the operations are done classically. So the qu quantum key distribution, the reason it's been able to leap out of the lab so easily is because there's a lot of effort that goes into these proofs. There's a lot of in quantum engineering that goes into building the systems, but all the processing then is purely classical. And so in a way, you don't have to rely on quantum computers or fancy quantum optic operations to actually make it work. That's one of the main reasons for its success. You, of course, rely on quantum resources at some point, but the processing is essentially classical. So then the last thing that you have to do to extract a key is you have to figure out a way to go from these sequences, which are identical now at Alice and Bob. You presumably assume that Eve has some partial information about it. Not all the bits can be guessed properly. And you want to transform that into a sequence that you would call a key. And so the way you do it is using a technique called privacy amplification, which um, has become a very central tool in information theory. Uh, it's actually much more than what I'm describing here. The idea is that Alice and Bob will independently process their observation, which are supposed to be the same, in such a way that Eve will be none the wiser as to what they're extracting. And if you think about the situation intuitively, at that stage, Eve has a few errors in her sequence. Bob and Alice know that because they've been able to, from the beginning, estimate how much information she had. And you can imagine that if I give you a sequence with a few bits that are wrong, if I ask you to take the XOR of that sequence, then your bits that you get in the end are likely to be not at all identical to the one that Alice and Bob would generate. And so the principle of privacy amplification is effectively that. It's called a hash, not just an XOR. It's a bit more uh, fancy. But the intuition is exactly this one. You're going to create a catastrophic error propagation by creating linear combination of these bits in such a way that Eve will be unable to infer what Alice and Bob are effectively computing. And that's a function phi that you apply independently at Alice and Bob on their sequence. And Eve doesn't know what it is because her errors propagate in a way that she cannot predict. Okay, so that, all these statements can be made extremely formal. Um, but that's the idea of a quantum protocol, and I will rely on that in, in, in the sequel. And that function is not transmitted via the same channel? Well, so that's an excellent point. Is that, is that function here transmitted? So, um, in principle, you could have a fixed function, but that fixed function is not hidden from the attacker. It's actually publicly known. And in practice, the specific class of function that people use are called seeded hash functions. There is actually a little parameter that Alice has to communicate to Bob, but again, it's done publicly. So these are kind of almost artifacts of the proofs. But uh, the, the idea is that you're not hiding anything about the behavior of the protocol uh, against the eavesdropper. The only thing that you rely on to ensure secrecy is quantum mechanics in that first stage. Everything else is actually perfectly deterministic and known to the eavesdropper. So that's really the beauty of the whole quantum key distribution approach is that you are really ensuring this unconditional security that relies solely on your ability to perform that first phase. And I'm hiding a lot of uh, under the rug, arguably, but uh, you, can, you have to trust me here, but this actually works. Okay? But all the processing subsequently, classical, known you're not hiding anything. So if you look back at the history now of four decades of quantum key distribution, things have gone a long way. You know, from the early proposal in 84 to the first uh, experiment on a 12 centimeter uh, optical link, people are now looking, uh, over the last two decades especially, have been able to analyze the security of quantum key distribution against this, you know, a, a whole class of attacks that are increasing uh, 
in sophistication. In particular, some of the latest security proofs are able to account for the fact that the attacker might actually be even able to influence your own detectors. So some of your imperfections could actually be under the control of the adversary. And even under that stringent condition, you can still prove that uh, quantum key distribution is sometimes possible. And if you look at what's been happening over the last few years, it's even more incredible. Things have really scaled up in terms of implementation. There have been records broken one year after the other, 300 kilometer transmission over fiber, thousands of kilometers in free space, there's a satellite now um, that was launched in 2017 that shares entangled photon that can be used to perform quantum key distribution. And some of the rates at which you can actually generate these secret keys have also now reached megabits per second. And understand, 26 megabits per second, that seems really low if you want to watch a Netflix movie. Uh, but actually, over 20 kilometers of fiber, when you think about uh, information encoded in, in tiny photons and subject to all the constraints, it's actually pretty high. So there's a lot that's been going on. Um, and so it's probably fair to say that at that stage, quantum key distribution is a fairly mature technology. There's still a lot to do if you want to do that at scale. Um, and certainly I expect that with all the efforts being pushed towards a quantum internet, that's what we'll start seeing more, like quantum key distribution on a large scale. But it's fairly mature. And uh, the question that you can therefore ask is, you know, what can you do beyond secrecy? I mean, we know how to generate unconditionally secret keys. Can we do more? And th that question is, is legitimate because when it comes to security, secrecy is actually just one component of security. Uh, you know, you and I right now probably worry about secrecy to the extent that we don't want our uh, bank account information to be out in the clear. But when you browse the internet, the main issue is privacy more than secrecy by which you're trying to hide, you know, who you are. So you are trying to hide attributes about what you're doing. Integrity is another issue that comes a lot when you talk about security. So secrecy is specifically focused on one characteristic, which is how do you hide the information content of a signal by keeping the content unintelligible by an adversary. But one thing that you could also think about is something that has now come to be known as covertness. You could also ask that the fact that you are communicating should also be hidden so that people cannot trace back some communication to you, for instance. Okay, so that's called covertness, and it differs from secrecy in that you're trying to hide the signal itself to ensure that you can communicate with a low probability of being detected. So secrecy and covertness are really different requirements. One is about the message content. The second is about the form of your signal or the shape of your signals. And you can think of covertness as one of the key objectives that's already being implemented in spread spectrum communication by the military left and right. Uh, it's used in steganography, for instance. Now, being an information theorist, we like to think about these problems in terms of limits. You know, what is the, max, you know, the maximum rate at which you can communicate subject to some constraints, such as secrecy, such as steganography? We also like to ask questions about, you know, what kind of resources do you need to enable these operations? And by resource, I mean things such as you know, a secret key if you're doing secrecy in a classical domain. If you're doing quantums, you know, a resource is an entanglement pair. You know, an entangled pair. That's a resource that, that costs you to generate, so you want to use it efficiently. And so when it comes to understanding covertness, there's been quite a bit of work um, out there, not a lot, but a few papers that have thought about it from a very classical perspective. You know, like if you can do beam forming, you know, does that give you an advantage in terms of being secret and covert? and people have looked at secure stego systems, but what really prompted my interest in that area is a sequence of fairly uh, fundamental papers that were written by uh, Professor Bashir and Professor Guha and their collaborators that really started to take a principled approach to the problem of covered communication. What does it mean to cover, to communicate without being detected? And they looked at it both from a classical perspective over, you know, if you wish, a canonical model of communication that corresponds to a, you know, let's say a wireless channel to make things simple, but also in the, in the quantum world. Can you define the stego before we go any further? Uh, okay, steganography, I, I will go into details as to how we model things. Steganography is the problem of hiding a message within um, uh, an innocuous, innocuous looking message. So think about there's a picture of a cat and I'm hiding a secret code in it. So that's a stego system. Um, and, and, you know, the, the history of stego systems goes back to the Greeks and, you know, they were, you know, tattooing secrets on the skulls of slaves, letting the hair grow back and sending them to transmit messages. So th that's the idea. Uh, it, it's become, you know, much more interesting in the context of uh, communications. <laughs> but, you know, 
th th that's as back as, as, as you want to go. Um, so um, what, what's interesting about these covered communication or these Stego systems is that there is an inherent trade-off. If you want to hide something in another object, you want to make sure you don't distort it too much. Right? So you can imagine if, if you start, you know, going back to my silly example, the, the skull of a slave, if you start tattooing too much and you know, the hair doesn't grow enough, you know, you'll see that there's something fishy. Okay, so there's a trade-off that you can ask to quantify. And in the context of communications, what we always care about is how many bits of information can we transmit if you allow me to use a channel n times, okay, or if I'm allowed to use n optical modes. And what, what Bulat and his collaborators showed is something interesting, which is that if you're allowed n uses of a channel, so think you're, you're transmitting n symbols over a link or you're using n optical modes, you can transmit no more than square root of n. Okay, and I'll try to give you the intuition for why that's the case, but that was essentially the essence of, of Bula's contribution, is to prove that very formally, saying that you can actually try to transmit you know, on the order of square root of n bits, but you should not try to do more, because if you try to do more, then detectors can start detecting you. But under that square root of n, you're actually safe. And what's interesting is that it tells you two things. One, uh, you can actually hope to establish what it means very quantitatively to be covered, but two, that it has to be inefficient. If you want to be covered, if you want to look like you're not doing anything when you're actually doing something, you have to be very careful because if you start pushing too much information, then you're going to get detected. And so the rates at which you communicate are very low. Okay? So what I'm interested in today is to discuss a little bit what it means to um, take these ideas from covered communication and try to push them into the land of quantum key distribution. And the question I want to try to answer is, is, is it possible to design a system that would allow you to do quantum key distribution and at the same time be undetectable? And as you'll see, that question is full of nuance. You know, how you model the problem will influence what your answer is. But one of the key messages that I will try to really highlight and, and hope that you will take away with you today is that coding plays a key role. You know, there's something that is a bit sophisticated that you have to deploy if you want that to happen in the first place. All right. So I'm going to be a bit more formal now with all that introduction about you know, what I'm going to try to achieve. So the system that we're after looks like the following. So what I'm going to describe now, it's typical of information theorists. You know, we have a very sandbox-like system that we can describe exactly, but we tr what we try to identify exactly is what resources are you deploying, who knows them, and who can use them. And so I'm going to try to walk you through that carefully to make sure we're on the same page. So the problem is we have a transmitter called Alice here whose objective is to send or generate a secret key with a receiver called Bob in the potential presence of an adversary, which here is W standing for Willy, not just Eve. And to achieve that objective, they have access to uh, different resources. So the first resource is that they might already have a little bit of a secret key that they share between themselves. Okay, and you can assume, you know, maybe they've already communicated in the past, maybe Alice visited Bob with a secret, you know, uh, briefcase with some codes in it, so they, they have some shared resource that nobody else knows. Now, of course, their goal is to generate a secret key, so you can imagine if you start using secret keys to generate new secret keys, you have to make sure that in the end you generate more keys than you use, otherwise you haven't accomplished anything. Okay, so we'll account for that, but that's a way to bootstrap the protocols, if you wish. Alice also has some uh, source of local randomness. What you want to think about is she's able to throw a dice and get some random numbers. And she can use that to decide how she's going to communicate and what she's going to communicate. So there's some randomization in the system, but this one is purely local to Alice. Bob has the same ability. He's able to also throw a dice to decide how he's going to measure something, for instance. And, of course, they can communicate with each other in two ways. They can communicate through a quantum channel. And that quantum channel, the way you want to think about it is that, you know, think of it as an optical fiber that links them. And so Alice is able to send photons through that. And so the photons, I describe them by a quantum state. I call that sigma tilde QN. She's actually able to use N modes. So she sends that through the channel. Bob is supposed to get something. And what they think is they think that they have a fiber that maybe has some loss. Maybe there is a bit of crosstalk. There is some noise. But, you know, they expect a specific channel because, they, you know, they, they know what their system should look like. But unfortunately, you know, they don't control their fiber. It's somewhere underground. And maybe there's an Eve that's been able to dug a hole and started doing weird things. Maybe she's replaced the fiber by something that has lower loss. Maybe she has 
you know, plug some of the fiber into detector that he then processes with a quantum computer. So the reality is that that channel, even though Alice and Bob kind of assume it's a quantum channel, in reality, Eve can, have, can replace that with pretty much anything. And that anything in quantum mechanics, you describe that by a unitary that transforms the initial state Q1 into, uh, a man uh, it, it entangles with a possible environment that's owned by the adversary. So that's the most general way to describe what an, ad an adversary could do. And the only limitation is that the adversary is limited by the laws of quantum mechanics. Now, the um, other resource that they have is they have a public com authenticated communication channel, meaning that they're allowed to talk to each other through Ethernet. But that Ethernet is not secure by itself. Like, if you start send a packet over the Ethernet network, Eve will intercept it. Your Eve dropper will intercept it and might be able to use that as side information to optimize how she is intercepting your data on the quantum channel. And finally, the last resource that you have, it's not quite a resource, the last uh, mode of operation that you have is Alice could actually decide not to do anything. She's like, well, I, I don't really want anyone to know I'm doing anything. So she could decide that instead of sending a state that is supposed to be used for processing, she's going to send a, a pure state zero, 0, I mean, think about it on your fiber, you're just sending vacuum, you're sending nothing. And, and that symbol here represents what I call an idle state, but what it means that you're, you're not transmitting. Okay, so this is how the system can work, and the objective is a bit more formally as follows. So th there is a joint state at the beginning that describes, if you wish, the correlations between the secret keys that Alice and Bob share, the way they use the local randomness, how it is used to encode the state that is sent by Alice. Then that goes through a channel, so the channel just uh, manipulates the quantum part. Potent potentially, it's manipulated by Eve, and I call that stage quantum state distribution. It's just the effect that the, the part of the protocol that describes Alice encoding data, transmitting it over the quantum channel. Then in, in a second stage, you know, once you transmit, potentially Bob and Eve receive something. Bob and Alice are going to run a protocol, which I describe generically effectively by another quantum channel, which I call D, but that protocol leads to three things. One, it creates some bits that you send over the communication channel, which is public, but it's authenticated, meaning that Eve can see it, but she cannot tamper it. Uh, she cannot tamper with it. And the reason it's fair to make that assumption is that there are some very fundamental results that show that ensuring authentication is much, much easier than ensuring secrecy. You need a few secret bits, but very little. So effectively, that's a resource that's much cheaper, almost comes for free. And the other last two parts that the protocol generates are secret keys. So Alice gets something I call SA, Bob gets something I call SB, and hopefully they play the role of secret keys. So at that stage, what I've done is I've described the setup in which I operate. I've described the kind of operations I'm allowing to uh, generate secret keys, and I've described the resources um, that are at my disposal. But the last thing I need to introduce for the problem to make sense, I need to introduce very clear metrics that will determine how the protocol works. Any questions on the model before I continue? Bob's secret code is not something he's sharing with Alice, right? He just receives the secret code from Alice. Correct. So you want to think of SA and SB as being the outputs that are generated at the end of the protocol. So Alice knows SA, Bob knows SB, and hopefully they are the same thing as we'll see, but a priori the protocol can do whatever. As long as, you, you, if you want to offer me a, a quantum key distribution protocol, all you have to do is that it satisfies these very general rules. Okay, but of course for the protocol to be interesting, we need to, to say what it does exactly and measure its performance. So the first measure of performance is the efficiency in terms, yes? In your, um, uh, on the authenticated communication channel, that you're not imposing a forward message requirement. That's correct. So I will get there in a second. So you're already pointing where it hurts uh, or poking where it hurts. But yeah, it's, it's coming. Yeah, so uh, uh, yes. Uh, also, the non manipulatable part of the public authentic channel, that's if the adversary is quantum powerful, then also classical powerful, right? Correct. So, I mean, why is that a requirement? Or is, with, with, if we don't assume that, does, that, does the whole protocol fail? So if you start allowing the attacker to manipulate that channel, then essentially Alice and Bob have no way of inferring anything. Because your adversary could manipulate the quantum channel, make it look like it's noisy when in reality it's noiseless. And then on the public channel, when you try to uh, 
exchange information to figure out, okay, what is the channel? Alice could, uh, sorry, Eve could fool Alice and Bob into thinking, yeah, yeah, the channel is noisy when really it's noiseless. So you need that public authenticated channel. Exactly. So that's very important, and that's what I tried to. I think I, I, I said it, but you're right to make me repeat it. The and I represent that by that little arrow that connects to the attacker here. The public authenticated channel is not hidden. So what's important is that we're putting in a way a resource which is the ability to authenticate, but we're not creating a resource by which something is secret. So in a way, we're not cheating. Given that the objective is to generate secret keys, we're not, you know sidestepping the problem by creating a secret resource that, that would make things easier. So we're not trivializing the problem at all, but that's an excellent point. So now I need to define you know, more formally what I want to achieve here. So the first thing I want to make sure is that at the end of the day, because I allowed myself to have a few secret bits as a resource, I want to make sure that when I get my secret key, it's longer than the number of bits I used. And you know, how much um, secrecy I have, I'm going to measure through the entropy. And so all I'm going to try to make sure is that the entropy of the key I generate exceed the entropy of the number of secret bits I've consumed. So as long as this quantity, that difference here, is positive, I'm in a regime where I'm doing secret key expansion. You give me a bit of secret keys, I borrow them from you, but then I generate more keys so I can give it back to you. It's like a good investment. Okay? The second thing that we want the protocol to do is we want the protocol to be robust, meaning that if there's no Eve interfering with whatever you do, we should not be aborting the protocol because we think she's actually manipulating. So the probability of aborting the protocol when there's no if dropping uh, should be very small. And I apologize, this is a wrong headline. Third, and that relates to what you were saying, my protocol a priori does not impose constraint on what is the key generated by Alice versus the key generated by Bob, but we're going to ask that given that we're not aborting the protocol, the probability that the two keys are not the same should also be very small. Otherwise, I'm exchanging something, but it's not the same, so you cannot use it as a secret key. So the secret key should be um, identical. So now we're getting in some of the more subtle aspects that really touch into on what we mean by secrecy and covertness. I'm going to ask that the information leakage at the end of the protocol about the keys I'm generating to the eavesdropper should be negligible. But because things are quantum, I need to measure that using a quantum measure. So I'm going to use, use here a norm one, so it's a, a trace norm. I'm going to ask that if you look at the joint state between the key that Alice is obtaining, the um, observations obtained by the eavesdropper over the quantum channel, and the classical communication that goes on over the public channel, it should effectively look like the key is uniform, so it's a set of random uniform bits that are independent of the observations available to the eavesdropper. Okay, so the key thing in that complicated metric here is the fact that I'm saying that the joint, if you wish, distribution of these three quantities looks like the key is actually independent of the observation. And if that's the case, I'll argue in a second that this is indeed you know, what secrecy should be. It means that Eve cannot do anything with respect to the key except guessing at random its value. And that's ultimate secrecy. Yes, Pula? So we're, we're, why do I not use uh, mutual information? So um, I mean, everything is quantum here, so I would have to use a, some quantum version of mutual information. Ultimately, secrecy is only about saying a statement about these two distributions. So you could choose your favorite metric. I'm choosing here a, a trace norm, but if you like to use another meaningful distance between, uh, between states in quantum, that would work just as well. Absolutely. So Sekat is making an excellent point. I was about to make it in the context of covertness, but when, it, when, when you want to connect these metrics to something more operational, somebody trying to guess what is the probability of making a mistake, the, 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 the metric that shows up naturally is indeed the trace norm. So think about uh, variational distance in the classical world. Well, you're right. I mean, we can argue that using different metrics will lead some, to some slightly different results, but these things are very much second-order effects in a way. I think conceptually what matters is that you're asking 
Hey Siri, do quantum mechanics for me. <laughs> You'd be surprised, by the way. Siri is very smart. You, she might actually have answers for us. Um, so what really matters in the definition of secrecy is the idea that you're asking that, you know, even though you're running a protocol that creates dependencies between all the observations and all the messages that go around, at the end of the day, it looks like the key is still independent from all the observations available to the eavesdropper. So that's uh, secrecy. We control the information leakage, if you wish. Covertness, remember, covertness is not a statement about the content that is in the signal that you transmit, it's a statement about the signal themselves. What we're going to ask is we're going to ask that when you look just at the part, that, uh, the state that describes what the attacker knows, which is the classical communication C and the quantum observation EN, we're going to ask that this looks like the classical communication are a bunch of uniformly distributed bits independent of the quantum observations, and we're going to force the quantum observations to actually look like the output of the channel to the eavesdropper when you don't transmit anything. So it's very important, and that goes back to the question that Sekat uh, raised earlier, it's very important to note that I'm putting a lot of implicit assumption as to what covertness even means here. What I'm asking is I'm asking that I'm hiding the fact that there is actually some meaningful operation going on on the quantum channel by asking that the quantum observations look like what you would get when you don't transmit anything over the channel. But I'm not really hiding what's happening on the public channel. I'm just asking the public channel to look like random bits of garbage, which are, however, independent of what's happening on the quantum channel. And that's crucial because you could imagine that if you do something on the quantum channel and then you send side information through the public channel, Eve has access to that, she could in principle try to tailor that public communication to infer something about what's happening on the quantum channel. So you want to make sure that the public communication does not help the detection on the quantum channel. But as Sekat pointed out earlier, I am not hiding the public communication. And actually it remains an open problem to figure out if you could even envision a fully covered system where you don't have a public channel at all. So we have partial answers about that, um, but they tend to be more restrictive in terms of the kind of um, attacks that we allow. There is an interesting paper on archive, which I will confess I do not understand, that are using some non-relativistic effect and quantum mechanics to have a fully covered system. Uh, I admit I do not understand that paper. And it's probably not very easy to implement, if I'm honest. Um, but again, to conclude, covertness only attempts to hide the quantum operation, and the public communication still looks like random bits, but it, it's not hidden as such. All right. So just to give a slightly more um, operational meaning to what I just did, l let me try to highlight what is the meaning of these quantities that I introduced to measure secrecy and covertness. So what I'm arguing is that when we talk about secrecy, what we really care about is if you have an attacker who has to guess what is your secret key, you want to make sure that it's not able to guess it at all, and more firmly, you don't even want him to guess one bit of your secret key. But effectively, when you ask that trace norm to be less than a small delta, you can choose delta to be as small as you want, that's a parameter that you tweak, it effectively ensures that the best attack that the attacker can launch is no better than a random guess of the bits. That's the operational meaning of that attack. Covertness has a slightly different operational meaning. Covertness is not about the information content, as I said. It's about the shape of the signals. You want to make sure that you cannot uh, have anyone detect your signals. And detection, if you've taken a detection and estimation class, a signal processing class, you know that any detector that you design is characterized by two parameters, the probability of false alarm and the probability of misdetection. You also know that there is actually a trade-off between these two, and most detectors, there is a knob that you can t tweak to actually uh, you know, run over the trade-off curve, and that's called the receiver operation characteristic curve, or ROC curve. And it's typically plot in a plane that shows one minus the probability of misdetection, so probability of detection versus probability of false alarm, and it's always possible to design a curve that sits in the upper diagonal part here. When we say that that trace one between the joint state between the classical communication and the uh, quantum observations is close to classical communication independent of uh, quantum communication being uh, 
also looking like you're not doing anything. What we're saying is that we're constraining the ROC curve of any detector that the attacker can launch to live within a very small constant, which I call mu here, of that diagonal ROC curve. So what, what, what is it telling us? That diagonal ROC curve that joins the point 0, 0 to the point 1, 1, it corresponds to a very simple detector. If you operate here at 0, 0, probability of false alarm is 0, probability of misdetection is 1. What is an example of such a detector? It's a detector that never clicks, never detects anything. It trivially achieves zero probability of false alarm, but of course it doesn't detect anything. Similarly, the point in the upper right corner, 1, 1 here, corresponds to probability of false alarm of 1, probability of misdetection of 0. This is again a detector that does very simple things. It always clicks. Whatever you do, it says there's something. And anything in between these two extreme points can actually be viewed as flipping a coin between these two behaviors. So if you design a very expensive detector, and at the end of the day, your performance is along that diagonal line, you've wasted a lot of money. Because any, you know, this completely dumb detector that I described achieved the exact same performance. So when I constrain that trace norm, I implicitly constrain the behavior of the ROC curve of any detector to be close to the behavior of that completely blind detector that operates without even looking at the data. So from a covertness perspective, what it means is that I'm not preventing your detector to claim that there's something going on. What I'm preventing the detector to do is to claim that it detects anything with any statistical relevance. Meaning that, you know, if you go in front of a judge and the judge asks you, show me that, you know, you detected someone, you can't prove anything because another person coming up with completely random measurements will have the exact same detection performance. So that's what covertness really means. You can't prove that you have anything going on in the quantum channel because you can achieve the exact same performance with a random measurement. All right. So now let's try to think about what can work and what can go wrong in particular when you try to bring all these concepts into play and you try to prove things. So the first thing that can go wrong is that this notion of covertness is very sensitive. We're asking that we have a very powerful quantum adversary that should not be able to detect that there's anything going on, but we've given the quantum adversary full control over the channel. And so as you can see intuitively, if you think again of your quantum channel as a fiber, you know, even if there's a single photon that you're leaking to the adversary, he's going to detect you because he knows that you're, you know, if you don't communicate, you don't send light. So as a result, you see that under the very generic assumptions that I promised at the beginning of my talk where I say, oh, let's give control of the channel to the adversary, you cannot have covertness because a single photon leaked to the adversary would, would leak to you being detected and the adversary can replace your fiber by a lossless fiber. So there's no way you can hide. And you can formalize that using what are known as no-go theorems. And you know, in the context of what I'm talking about here, you can show something like, oh, if you want your probability of error to go to zero, meaning the keys are the same, you want secrecy that delta parameter goes to zero, and you want covertness that mu parameter goes to zero, if the channel is arbitrary, you don't get any key out of it. Okay, and there are various, notion, various uh, variations of these no-go theorems, some of which uh, were actually started by uh, Bulat and Seikat a while back, but there are different versions of these results that say, if you have an adversary that's too powerful, you cannot do anything. Okay, so at that stage, you have two options. You know, if you're a grad student, you can sit down and cry, or you can say, okay, what can I do to fix the problem? All right, and um, I was fortunate to have a very dedicated student to work with me on this. And so the natural thing to do is, well, let's relax a little bit the attacker model. Maybe we can't really do everything against a super powerful quantum adversary. Maybe we have a little bit of restriction that we need to impose. And the restriction that we're going to impose is that actually there's part of the channel that is actually not controlled by the adversary. So we call that a probe. But what we're going to say is that when Alice transmits something, it first goes through a quantum channel, which we call epsilon here. That channel is actually well behaved. It acts independently across the different modes. That's you know, in part for analytical tractability. But it, you know, think of it, it, it describes some noise process that really should not be under the control of anyone because it's really too complicated. And then maybe there's the rest of the channel, your fiber, once it really leaves your lab, that the eavesdropper can control. And so under these conditions, we'll see that we can do a lot more. But you see, we need to restrict the attacker model. There is some noise that has to be unavailable to the, to the attacker. Okay? But under these assumptions, we'll be able to do something. So 
Before moving forward, you know, I've talked about covertness, but I think it's still a pretty vague concept. You know, how do I achieve that? So I want to highlight intuitively why covertness is even possible and give you a sense for why that square root n shows up in the first place. I announced it in my third slides, and it was still puzzled, right? So what's happening when you want a system to be covered is the following. At some level, you're designing a system where you have a, 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 a state or a symbol, let's call it zero, that says you do nothing. But if you want to transfer information, we all know you need to modulate. You know, you need to, if you want to transmit over your optical fiber, you need to modulate between at least two levels of energy. Otherwise, there's no information being transferred. So we need at least another symbol. I'm going to call it one. And you see that if you want to be covered, you have implicitly a tension between two objectives. Because on the one hand, if you want to transmit information, you need to be able to modulate. And the faster you modulate, or the more you allow yourself to modulate, presumably the more information you convey. But the more you do so, the less your signal looks like zero because you're adding ones. Okay, so to make that intuition a bit more formal, let's do a small diagram. Let's imagine on the left a signal in the time domain that's going to modulate between zero and one. And on the right, let's imagine the kind of statistical distribution that you would be able to observe if you were an adversary you know, looking at the signal. So if you transmit zero, okay, that's what we call being idle, no communication. Even though you don't do anything at the input of your channel, you know, when somebody makes a measurement, they presumably have noise. And in the model I introduced before, remember, we assume there is that noise that's not under the control of anyone. So you would observe, for instance, this bell-shaped curve. If you transmit a 1, you can imagine that pictorially I would distort that distribution, which I'm representing by a shift in the bell-shaped curve. This is typically if you do on-off keying in an optical fiber and you measure the statistics at the receiver, this is what you would observe. You know, think of it. A lot of you, I'm sure, think are familiar with eye diagrams when you measure what's happening in an optical uh, communication system. This is what your optic, uh, eye diagram effectively captures, these distributions. Uh, but as you can see, you know, the distributions are overlapping a little bit, but they're sufficiently different that if you were to design a detector that says, you know, I'm going to kind of look at how many times I'm measuring something that is close to x1 versus something that looks to x0, you will eventually figure out whether you're transmitting x1 or x0. Okay, so these two symbols are distinguishable, especially if you repeat that many, many times. Now, in a communication system, when you code information, usually um, you modulate, so you have sequences of zeros and ones, semi-random looking. And so the distribution that you induce is actually a mixture, but that mixture, you can convince yourself still looks like it's pretty much distinguishable from my yellow curve, which is my reference. So in principle, that mixture would be viewed as detectable, and we can make that formal. So how do we make that undetectable? Well, intuitively, we have to use very few ones. If you transmit very few ones, your mixture has two modes, but these two modes start collapsing into one that looks like you're not doing anything. And so the magic behind covered communication is to find the sweet spot where even though you're doing a mixture, by transmitting a few ones every once in a while, that mixture is statistically indistinguishable from the original distribution corresponding to no communication. So let's take a step back. What does it mean to detect? Detect means I'm acquiring observation and then I'm running a statistical test to decide whether I communicate or not. In that case here, you can imagine that the statistical test that's relevant is you estimating the mean value that you're receiving. Now, if you remember statistics, you can compute uh, you know, an estimator of the mean value by averaging your samples, and you'll get a value. But the other thing that also matters is the variance of your estimation. And what you know is that if you don't have enough samples, there will be an intrinsic variance. You, know, you can think of it as statistical noise. If you want to reduce the statistical noise, you need more observations to confirm that you're estimating the right quantity. So the reason covered communication is governed by the square root of n is because if you try to estimate the mean here of your distribution with n samples, you have a noise that is in 1 over square root of n. And so if the fraction of ones that you transmit is of the same order, 1 over square root of n, you're effectively hiding in the statistical noise. And that's why it's very hard to detect. So the square root of n comes from statistics. It's saying it's quantifying the level of disturbance that cannot be detected because the fluctuation is on the order of this fluctuation of the statistical noise. I think that's the simplest way to think about covertness. So you also see why fundamentally it has to be inefficient, because you cannot transmit too many bits. If you push too much information, you're going to make yourself detectable, because suddenly the deviation becomes statistically noticeable. And so to achieve covertness, 
there are really two things that will matter. So we'll have to control the optimal fraction of symbols x1 that correspond to you communicating, as I mentioned before. What's a little bit more subtle, and that's what I will try to convey to you in the remaining part of my talks, is you have to be a bit smart about how you decide when you transmit these non-idle symbols. Okay, so the last part of my talk is a bit more technical, but uh, I hope to convince you that uh, there's a very nice intuition. So, yes? Can I use the non-uniform signal again to uh, achieve your assumption? Um, so when you say non-uniform so signal... Please understand the one with very small probability. Yeah, so absolutely. So if you think about it, the way you want... The energy to be is very similar to just Absolutely. So effectively, you know, effectively what you can show very formally is that if you want to be covered at the minimum, the fraction of ones that you, you transmit should be 1 over square root of n. So you can think it's like you're, you know, you're using a Bernoulli p distribution with p 1 over square root of n. That's a spirit. Now keep in mind, though, is that when you talk about flipping coins, you're implicitly assuming that you have ID coins, right? Um, we're asking that the protocol could, in principle, introduce correlations, but these correlations have to be hidden. And I'll get to that subtlety here. Keep that in the back of your mind, because that's what's creating problems. Did I answer your question? Yes. All right. All right, so let's go back to our quantum business here. So how do we design a quantum key distribution system that is both secure and covered? We know how to do security and secrecy. But coveredness is a tricky part, and as I've argued, coveredness has to do with the shape of the signals we transmit. And as I've just argued a second ago, we essentially need to make sure that we're very careful as to when we transmit. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost, I think I'm reading Ivan's mind here. You would say, well, here's what I'm going to do. I know that there is a certain probability that I should use to transmit, and I have to be careful, and maybe it, you know, it's one over square root of n to make sure I'm not detected. So here's what I'm going to do. Over n modes that I can use for my transmission, I'm going to select square root n of them. You know, and you can do that, as you said, flip a coin, which is heavily biased, that gives you transmit with probability 1 over square root of n. Don't transmit with probability 1 minus uh, 1 over square root of n. And, you know, when it tells you not to transmit, you don't do anything. When it tells you to transmit, that's when you run your QKD protocol. So it's like you're, you know, spreading the use of your QKD protocol very carefully over many, many channel uses. And indeed, that works. You can show that indeed such an operation would be covered, would also be secret, assuming you know, you're under the mild assumption I described where there's a bit of noise not controlled by the adversary. Um, so, so far, so good. Uh, there are a couple of very nice things about that, that, um, that protocol. The um, encoding block length is effectively square root of n. Even though you use n modes, that's where you tell the eavesdropper, hey, I'm going to transmit in that window. In reality, you use a much smaller window, and you're hiding it from the adversary. You're completely decoupling the covertness from the secrecy, because the covertness you handle by choosing when you transmit, and then the secrecy you run your favorite QKD protocol. What's the catch? The catch is you need to choose the square root of n positions. And one way to think of them is think of them as you choose square root of n out of n, uniformly at random, or you flip a Bernoulli coin, which is heavily biased. In both cases, the problem is if you look at the number of bits you need to choose these positions, it behaves like square root n log n. And that's problematic because if you only use these positions, Bob needs to know when to look. Because if Bob doesn't know when to look for these bits that contain the QKD information, he's no wiser than the adversary. And so the only way you can achieve that operation is if you share a secret key between Alice and Bob, which scales at square root n log n. But because your effective block length is square root of n, there is no way that the scaling of the number of bits you generate can be fast enough to compensate for the number of keys you need to make the protocol work in the first place. And so this was observed by um, uh, Juan Miguel Arazola in, in, in a series of papers in which he came to the very disappointing conclusion that, forget it, covered secret key generation is impossible. But I'm going to argue that the answer is more nuanced than that, and that actually this observation here is not at all fundamental. So what, 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 what's really happening here? What's happening is that the reason covered and secret key generation doesn't work is not because of you know, us being unable to try to put it into play. The fundamental issue is that right now, the way I've described it, the resources we consume in terms of secret keys exceed the resources that we create in terms of secret keys we generate. So we cannot expand secret keys. However, what can we change? Fundamentally, the problem that's at stake here 
is that we're creating these signals that to be covered have a very diffuse information content, meaning that you really have square root of n bits of information hidden in, in n modes. And you know, if n is large, that's, you know, you're hiding them very well. You're looking for a needle in a haystack. And from the perspective of the receiver, understand it's problematic. If you look for a needle in a haystack, you'll never find it. Think about something being hidden in the noise. You know, unless you really know where to look for, it's very hard to find. And in a way, the coordination that indicated to Alice and Bob the positions where to, where to transmit, that was a way, a trick, to reconcentrate that needle in fewer positions where Bob knew to, how to look for. But in a way, we've overplayed our hand a little bit because we've coordinated so much that the resources needed for coordination exceed what we're actually generating in terms of secret keys. But the reality is that there's nothing fundamental about this. And I'm going to try to argue in the remaining minutes that I have that we can relax that coordination requirement a little bit at the expense of something much more sophisticated. All right, so... And then I'm going to encode the which position, something like that, right? Let's hold on to that thought. It's, it's a bit more subtle. I'm going to encode them, but not, not in a random way. I'm going to use a very specific way of coding. So hold on to that thought, Ivan. Bear with me. It, two slides. <laughs> I'll give you the answer. All right. And so uh, this whole work stems out of a series of papers I wrote with my students in which we've explored these, these various aspects. And really want to give credit to Merdad, who graduated uh, two years ago. Ishak also graduated two years ago. Um, they did some amazing work to understand this at a fundamental level and put it in, you know, I think, cool, cool papers. All right, so how much time do I have left? Five minutes? Okay, perfect. All right, so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to put more... Okay, so I'm a coding person, all right? So... I like to design error control codes. Error control codes differ from non-error control codes by having structure. Okay, we put structure, and that structure somehow allows us to correct errors. Okay, so we're gonna, this idea is very powerful. You can manipulate information much more easily in general if there's structure to it. Um, I don't know if some of you are working in adaptive optics and compressed sensing, for instance, but compressed sensing is a series of algorithms that work extremely well because there is some structure that we implicitly assume in your data. So. Same idea. Structure is very powerful. It's a very general principle in, in, in signal processing. And so I'm going to try to do that here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to move away from the idea that I'd have to send, say, like, you know, the positions at which I transmit completely randomly. I'm going to put a bit more structure in the signaling by using pulse position modulation. What that means is that I'm going to create sub-blocks of size M, and I'm going to require that in these sub-blocks, I transmit in one and only one position, and the rest of the time I don't transmit. And then I'm going to concatenate you know, these blocks, and I can take L of them, for instance. So what's changing? What's changing is now you see that I know, if I look at the slice of time, that I, there is exactly one position in which I transmitted. Now, the good news is it turns out that you can still show that if you choose the scaling of M and L correctly, as long as M is large enough and L scales appropriately, you, you can still be covered, meaning despite the structure, the structure can still be hidden. But what are we gaining by doing that? What we're gaining... So, what do you mean by that? But if you know that every M bits, one bit is there, you just break up the entire thing into blocks of M, integrate one by one, I mean blocks of M, and then whatever you get, that's your signal. That's true. Now, keep in mind that, you know, the precision of any statistical estimation is depending on the number of observations that you get. So if you choose M pretty large, you will still have a difficulty detecting anything. And M is presumably, you know, think of M as being square root of the total block length, L being square root of N2. So square root of N, you know, length of your sub-block times square root of N number of blocks, you get a block of length N you can still prove that despite the structure, and you know, you're right, you could actually deploy such a detector, but such a detector would not be able to detect. But that requires a very precise choice of the scaling of M and L. Okay? But you are right. So potentially there is more structure that can be exploited for detection, but upon appropriately choosing the parameters, you can still make that hard. Okay? But what are we g really gaining by doing this? The structure allows you to think about how you address the positions where you transmit differently. And specifically, let me think of it this way. In every sub-block, 
Alice and Bob need to choose where they put their, the, the bit that's going to be used to transmit QKD information. But instead of thinking of me having to address exactly that position, I can think of me addressing it with two numbers that I call x and v, and there's a function that maps this x and v to an exact position. But x and v individually only contain partial information about the location. And the best way to illustrate that is with a diagram. Imagine the following situation. The mapping dxv tells you if you know x and if you know v, you know exactly where you transmit your PPM symbol, but v by itself, for instance, only tells you it's only either in position 1 or in position 5. So you need x to resolve that by telling you one more bit of information, it's either 1 or it's either 5. Does that make sense? So you can think about the addressing working in a hierarchical way. v gives you partial information, and you need to fully resolve the information using x. And that can be achieved in plenty of different ways. All you need is d to be a one-to-one -one bijection between m, and uh, if you think of this as bits, as, as log m. You know, like, so it's a one-to-one -one addressing mapping. But the trick we're going to deploy is we're going to allow ourselves to code the bits x and the bits of v differently. Okay, and so that, that's a bit subtle, but essentially we're going to allow ourselves to say that the mechanisms by which we generate these bits x and these bits v that eventually together index the position of my PPM symbols can be different. And that will turn out key to reduce the number of key bits you need to share from square root n log n to square root of n. So let me try to describe the, the protocol the way it's going to work now, and, and then I'll give you the, the gist of the result for why, why that's going to work. So according to my protocol, so I need to find a state. I'm going to choose one state that's not you know, completely orthogonal to the zero state corresponding to me doing nothing, and I'm going to make sure that I have a technical condition that says that my choice of the state is not trivially detectable. So let me not dwell upon that. I'm going to divide my transmission into LPPM blocks of size m, such that the total blank length is Lm, and I'm going to create two sets, I call them x and v, such that their cardinality is equal to m, and there's a mapping that tells me if you have a symbol x and a symbol v, it maps to a position of your PPM symbol. Okay? So in the, in the ice uh, sub-block, not sun-block, what Alice transmits is essentially uh, a state phi here that is in a position in that PPM block that is indexed by d. And to make that happen, you need a sequence for all the blocks of bits, uh, sorry, of symbols x and symbol v. So the symbol x, they're going to be generated locally. Okay, so they're going to be generated id by Alice and uniformly at random. And these are not going to be shared with Bob. So that's part of the coordination that you're actually not coordinating with Bob. I'm only going to coordinate the part v. So this is the one that we're going to generate jointly uh, from the perspective of Alice and Bob using the secret key R. Now, if you think about what's happening from the perspective of the symbol that you sent, from the perspective of, of, um, of Bob, what's happening is that you are randomizing partially, meaning that uh, from the perspective of Bob, Bob... Um, sees the randomization from x, but not the randomization from v, because v is obtained from a shared key that he knows. And so what you're effectively is you're creating a weird channel by which you can think of v as being the input, and that input is going through a classical quantum channel whose output from the perspective of the eavesdropper looks like the mixture of these PPM symbols partially known. And so the question that you can answer is that is there any benefit in terms of the number of bits of, like, that you need to generate, that you need to use to generate V and still make them look like they're uniform from the perspective of the adversary. So let me trace back. We want the PPM symbol to look like they're chosen uniformly at random because you can trust me, providing you choose M and L correctly, you can be covered. Here I'm changing the way I address these bits in such a way that some of the bits need not be communicated to Bob and on top of that, I'm trying to be more efficient with the bits that I coordinate. And I'm trying to make sure that my encoding of the bits of V make it look like from the perspective of the eavesdropper that they're generated ID when they might not be. Okay, so the last thing, uh, yes, again. 
second point in your slide. Here? Yeah, so that L and M, they are the same choice that uh, as in the standard classic four Yep. Yeah. The cardinality of the X and the V sets, are they both order M? Uh, or like, well, you know, so what is the scale of X and cardinality of X? And okay, so the way it's going to work, you can think of M as being square root of N, yes. L is square root of L N. So X and V, so the, the, the difference between this is something I'm going to optimize at the end. Okay, so because it, it's going to depend ultimately on the quality of the channels. It's going to depend on what this uh, channel, this probe that introduces noise is. However, the scaling, you know, you'll, I will try to argue in a second why the scaling is going to change for V. So what really matters is if you look at this, what's happening is that there is that mixture that you're creating from the perspective of the eavesdropper. So the eavesdropper is not just saying one PPM symbol, he's, he's seeing a mixture of potential PPM symbols. And, and because of that, you can rely on the fact that the mixture that you create by randomizing X coupled with the noise that's introduced to the channel allows you to be more efficient in terms of the number of bits that you're using to make it look like it's ID. It's pretty long-winded argument. So t I want to finish by answering Ivan's question. Why is something like that even possible? And to abstract the complexity, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to talk about a purely classical problem from information theory that solves what we want. Okay? So you might remember information theory as something that allows you to analyze the capacity of a channel, which is the maximum number of bits you can communicate reliably. But information theory actually allows you to analyze much more diverse problems, including one that is fairly obscure, but is directly relevant to our problems. Let's imagine the following situation. Let's imagine I give you a channel, and that's you know, a kernel, but it just says my channel adds noise. You can send some noisy, oh, sorry, a random process at the beginning, you're going to get something random at the output. And you know the statistics at the input, you know the channel, you can compute the statistics of the output. You could ask the following question. It's very expensive to create something that's truly random here. Can I replace that truly random something here by a code? And what is a code? A code is an object that takes some random numbers and maps them to code words that you then transmit over the channel. So if you think about the difference between the situation on the left and the situation on the right, it is as follows. On the left, you're transmitting random bits. So every possible sequence, for instance, if you flip a coin, you have every possible sequence of ones and zero is possible with some probability. The moment you start using coded sequences, it looks a lot more sparse. There are sequences that you can generate because they are code words corresponding to mapping a message, but there are others that you will never generate because they never are mapped from a message to a specific sequence. And so you have a distribution at the input that is very spiky, if you wish. You put mass points on some code words and not on some others. When you send it through the channel, though, the channel adds its own noise. And so the distribution at the output of the channel is actually still maybe somewhat spiky, but you're convoluting you know, the kernel here of the channel with the probability mass here. So it's looked like you're taking a mixture of noises of the channel that can be added onto your symbols. And the question that information theorists have asked is, is it possible to manipulate how I design my code in such a way that I cannot statistically distinguish what's happening when I'm not coding versus what's happening when I code? And these results are fairly fancy. I just wanted to highlight here to show you the flavor of what they look like. They're, they're telling you that, yeah, it's possible to analyze the behavior of, say, the relative entropy between the distribution QZ here and distribution PZ there. And there are conditions that correspond to the rate of the code that allow you to guarantee that that quantity can be made small. So two messages here. One, it's possible, actually. Maybe a bit surprising, but the intuition is that even though your distribution does not look like at all it's something that's, you know, say, ID, here, because of the noise of the channel, you can uh, hide the fact that you create that uh, spiky distribution. And two, the result fundamentally takes the following form, and for the sake of time, I'll be a bit fast here, but it's telling you that if you want a code that is able to achieve that effect, it needs to operate beyond the capacity of the channel. So below capacity, you know you can decode. So it's not surprising that below capacity, you would not be able to hide the fact that you're coding, because if you can decode, it means you're able to find the structure. But above capacity, this result tells you that you can completely hide the structure. And what's important is that it tells you that the rate at which you need to randomize is dictated by your mutual information. And back to Ivan's point, the reason that saves us in the context of this quantum key distribution problem 
is that if you give me x to be a very biased Bernoulli distribution with probability 1 over square root of n, the mutual information scales like, uh, so n times the mutual information will scale like square root of n, whereas the entropy of x scales like square root n log n. And so that's the trick and the only trick I'm using to actually make the quantum key distribution work in a covered fashion. I'm coding some of the randomization data accounting for the presence of the noise on the eavesdropper's channel to be more efficient in terms of the number of bits I need to coordinate. And the reason it works is because I, I kind of split the coordination between my coordination and what I don't need to coordinate because presumably I can recover it uh, given the quality of the channel. And so that, that's a dirty trick. So it's, it's arguably very technical. Um, for the sake of time, I, I don't want to abuse your time. I'm going to split some of the more funky details of the protocol that involve, you know, how do you then deploy the fact that in addition to this funny way of addressing the PPM symbols, you need to do parameter estimation, you still need to do information reconciliation, and you still need to do privacy amplification. Just understand that part is, is a bit more mechanic. We know how to do it. It doesn't work very well right now. Uh, I want to highlight with some parting thoughts. I'm a theoretician, but coming from a quantum optics lab where I once coded photon, it's important to show what it would mean in practice. And so you can analyze what our protocol would do on a situation where you would model your channel by a beam splitter. You know, a fairly simple example that could capture a, a, a loss in a fiber. And um, we assume that, you know, we expect the loss to be a certain thing, but part of the losses could be controlled by Eve. And then we can compute, you know, the kind of bits per PPM symbol that we would be able to generate secretly and covertly. And it's not very high, and even for a very high transmissivity here of the part of the channel you don't transmit, so it means a very short fiber um, that the eavesdropper could control. So we have a transmissivity above, you know, 99.5%. The number of bits per PPM symbol we get is on the order of 10 to the minus 3. So it is a very inefficient regime. So you're not going to get any covered secret bits anytime soon. Now, arguably, you know, a number of PPM symbols, you know, it might take time, but you can get as many as you want. The big challenge is that our analysis is very restricted because we do not know how to do the quantum tomography efficiently. So in a way, we're very pessimistic as to what the eavesdropper can do. And we believe we can do much more than that. Uh, but right now, we have limits in our analysis that tell us it's not really working well. But it's not zero, okay? So we went from saying it's not possible to saying, well, it might be possible, but very inefficiently. So to, to conclude um, on, on what I talked about today. So when you start looking at covered communication, there are some very unusual things coming on. And, and really, it, it all finds its roots in the square root law that uh, Bulat and Sekat identified a few years back. And what, to me, is really interesting is that covertness is very different from secrecy. You put a constraint on what your signal should look like versus what your signal should contain. And that completely changes the game. There's some very interesting coding that has to be deployed, very non-traditional type of coding, where you're using your code to efficiently hide the structure, not at all to uh, allow errors to be decoded. But it's just a different way to think about the code, but um, it is definitely not coding for reliability. There's a long way to any efficient system implementation. There are some real analytical difficulties that we're facing right now that I think we might be able to circumvent. Um, but we've made some real progress in actually designing algorithms that would actually work here. And so I really want to thank you for your time. It's really been a pleasure. My visit has been outstanding here. I've had awesome discussions with many uh, of you here. And I want to conclude on a humoristic manner. So just a few hours ago, I visited Jeshen's lab. And, you know, we had a covered communication testbed set up. And it looks like this. And so it's covered because you don't see it. All right. So <laughs> on that note, um, I, will, I will stop here and, and thank you again for your time.